I uh, love Tate Mooring's sense of gardening style. Thanks so much for opening your gates for us. Right now we're going to be talking about growing grapes, one of the hottest topics here in Texas because of all the wineries. Uh, we have uh, Jim Camus with us. Uh, it's great to have you back on the program. Welcome to Thanks, Central, Tom. Appreciate so welcome it. back to Central Texas Gardener. Uh, you've just published a great new book, Growing Grapes in Texas. Uh, congratulations on that. Thanks a lot. It was a, took a couple of years to get done, but I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Well, you know, it, like I said, it's a hot topic. A lot of people are very interested in growing uh, grapes in their backyard. Maybe uh, one of those famous table grapes like Concord or something like that. Well, Concord's pretty tough to grow here. Concord likes acid soils, which we don't don't have and it's much more adapted to cooler climates so mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to grow Fredonia or some of the other Labrusca types they'll work but Concord's a pretty tough one to grow here. Okay well the, the, your book is filled with tips about varieties and things like that but let's focus on that on that home grower you know I, I know for example I go out to the hill country every now and again to go to Fredericksburg or places around there and I see wineries springing up like mushrooms now yeah. and it kind of makes me want to grow grapes here in town what is, what is a home a gardener need to know to get started. Well, if you're a homeowner and you want to make uh, grow enough gr uh, vines to, to produce a little bit of wine, my advice is plant what you like. If mm -hmm. we're having a com planting a, a commercial vineyard, we're going to have a very different discussion. But if you like Merlot, plant Merlot. If you like Syrah, plant Syrah. But uh, uh, again, for a small scale, you have no big economic investment, so plant what you like and go with that. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. And. Uh, what, in terms of the space needs, the sun, all those kinds of things, grapes are rather particular and disease prone. Yes. So let's give people an idea of what the kind of the basics are that they would need to have any kind of success. Sure. Commercially, our rows are spaced nine to ten feet apart, but in the backyard, if you're you know maintaining the row centers with a lawnmower or something, you can uh, place the rows as close as six feet apart, and you can also go as tight as five to six feet between vines. So you can put a lot of vines in, in a, at a relatively small space. So uh, uh, small space is okay. Um, uh, when we talk about the rows, we are talking about uh, providing gr uh, uh, structures on which the, the vines can grow and support themselves. Yes, a lot of times in California you'll see these freestanding vines that are called head prune vines. They don't do very well here because we need to keep our vines up off the ground because it rains here during the summer and they're very mm -hmm. disease prone as you mentioned. So we put them up on a trellis to uh, try and intercept sunlight and, and dry the canopy a little quicker. Yeah, you mentioned sunlight and they absolutely have to have full sun. They need full sun and again that's the limitation of row spacing. Six feet is about as tight as you can put rows together and still get full sunlight yeah. penetration on the, on the vine. Well, we have everything from heavy clay soils, which hold moisture for a long time, to uh, those uh, limestone soils, which uh, hardly hold moisture at all. Uh, so uh, what, what do grapes really prefer? Well, the, the grapes are pretty tolerant of all kinds of soil types. Now commercially, again, if we're on some of these high pH caliche soils, we'll put them on a rootstock that's adapted to those kinds of soils. So for a homeowner, that's kind of hard to do because you're typically ordering those by the thousand, not by the ones and twos. Right. But ohm rooted varieties, if you have any kind of soil at all, they're pretty tolerant of soil types. Okay, so uh, this sounds pretty promising for a lot of folks out there. Let's talk about the pruning a little bit because this is something I think that uh, it, it can be intimidating for the homeowner, uh, but uh, you do, this is a fruit crop that needs heavy pruning, right? Yeah, they're the most heavily pruned of our perennial fruit crops. We normally take about 90% of the annual growth off of a vine 90%? every single year. Yes. Okay. Grapevines are, are produced on current season's growth, so each bud you leave will produce a shoot with one, two, or perhaps three clusters of grapes. So you don't need many buds, 20, 30 buds per vine to produce a full crop. Okay, so prune heavily uh, and, and, and train them uh, so that they, they can, again, be supported by the uh, the trellises or whatever you set yeah, up. Yeah, trellises can be relatively simple. You can simply have a one or two wire trellis, something to train, as you mentioned, the arms out on uh, so they get good sunlight and you get good fruit quality. Yeah. What I usually tell people if I get questions about grape pruning is I say, find a good source of images and look at the pictures and your book provides that. <laughs> well you have to it's, and there are a lot of different <clears throat> ways to train vines but you know pick a, a pruning system that, that's easy uh, that works for your location and and yeah take a look at some photos and and that will give you a cue as to uh, how to train and prune the vines. What about fertilizing what what's the preferred thing I've always heard that nitrogen is good for the grapes. What It is and again it depends on soil type and and how much fruit you're trying to produce. I know some gro com commercial growers that have applied no nitrogen in five years. Their soils are simply uh, that fertile or the vines are simply that that good at exploring the soil for nitrogen. So the answer is quite a bit it depends but but grapevines 
te uh, tend to take a lot less nitrogen than some of our other fruit crops like peaches or pears. Okay, well that's good. So what, what do you use if, if you have uh, what you think is a, a good situation with nitrogen in the soil? Uh, you know, really, uh, the only other element that's taken out by, by fruit is going to be potassium. So, honestly, if you just put a good compost or mulch underneath the trellis, uh, the decomposing organic matter will provide the nitrogen, and there's enough potassium in there to supply the needs for a number of years. Well, you mentioned the decomposing material underneath, and that does remind me about the, uh, the disease situation. It, having good kind of sanitation under the plants is very important, right? It's imperative. It's, it, you need to have a, a, a clean uh, vineyard floor and uh, need to make sure that and sanitation, as you mentioned, is, is a, goes a long way in, in keeping uh, the fungal disease pressure down. And we, have, we face a lot of uphill battles fighting fungal pathogens in grapevines. Yeah, so uh, beware of too much leaf litter, those, that kind of thing in, in, in soil underneath your grapevines. Yes. And in terms of controlling, all, we've referenced the fact now several times that they are somewhat disease prone. You know, if, if you're trying to be organic yes. and not to use, uh, you know, all these different fungicides, what's the best approach? Well, you know, we can control powdery mildew with sulfur and a little bit of copper. We can control downy mildew with copper. Black rot is the Achilles heel of organic fruit production. And, and again, that may be where sanitation plays the best role. If you see infected leaves or infected fruit, remove them. Sulfur and copper don't do much to, uh, to, to control black rot, so it's going to be an uphill battle. Uh, but that's, that's probably about the best we can do. Yeah, so again, good sanitation, maybe a little bit of prevention or a treatment is called for with the copper and sulfur. Yes. Okay. Well, that's all great. Now, um, pests. I don't. I don't think of pests that much when I think of grapes, uh, except for birds and squirrels. Yes. You know. Well, occasionally well, there's a there's a, a a moth that lays an egg uh, in the in the berry called grape berry moth. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen it uh, on occasion. It's become more common the more the more vineyards we plant. Yeah. Uh, but again, that's the kind of thing you can you can scout for and remove and take out of of the. Uh, of, of the vineyard, mm -hmm. and if you do see early season infestation, there are a number of different organic sprays or inorganic sprays, if that's your mindset, uh, that with good timing you can control berry moth. Okay, all right, and um, just using netting is, is adequate for birds, you think? That's probably a necessity. I mean, you can use you can, uh, hawk kites, you can use you know scare cannons, you can do all kinds of things, but ultimately if you want to control birds, you're going to have to net them. Okay, all right. Let's talk about uh, the different varieties that are uh, popular here and uh, we, you would recommend for trying in uh, either, I guess, a commercial or a home setting. Um, uh, in the book, you have these beautiful descriptions of, of the, the plants and the grapes and the, the kinds of wines they produce. Syrah is one that is on your list. Why Syrah? Well, Syrah is, is a variety that first was adapted to southern France, and that's really what's shining for us now is these hot weather varietals. So Syrah, uh, Syrah or Shiraz, as the Aussies would call it, uh, makes a beautiful wine and is commonly blended uh, with a couple of other own varietals to make some really, really nice blended wines. Uh, you mentioned the hot weather varieties. I think of Spain and Italy, Sangiovese San is another one on your list. Yes, it is. Uh, it's, it's a, it breaks dormancy relatively relatively early and so it's real risk is being caught with spring frost uh, but the wines that have been made from it have been outstanding. Yeah. In the hill country I keep hearing all these people rave about the Viognier as, as kind of the, the grape of the hill country. What? Well Viognier and Vermentino are both becoming very popular. Viognier was first uh, popularized because it, it makes these, these beautiful uh, spicy wines. I, I kind of consider it to be kind of like the Gewürztraminer, uh, the hot weather Gewürztraminer that's very spicy, uh, that uh, uh, it's it's a little bit tricky to grow, but it's it's, it's being grown with, with wide success. Okay, and real briefly, let's give folks a couple of table varieties that would you think are the best for Texas. Well, really, in most of Texas, we need to worry about uh, Pierce's disease, and there's a new variety we, that we released a few years ago with the University of Arkansas uh, called Victoria Red. It's a beautiful, big cluster, big buried uh, table grape. Uh, it's being more and more carried by nurseries, uh, Womax Nursery, uh, AA Nursery. They're both, they're both propagating this and have it for sale. Uh, supplies are rather limited, but they will be increased in the future. All right, so people should be looking for Victoria Red. Red yes. All right, well, Jim Thomas, again, congratulations on the book. Thank you, as always, for being a part of Central Texas Gardener. Now it's time for Backyard Basics. Mm -hmm.